Hi, so this is the introduction to functional programming class at the Federal University of Federal University of Technology Paraná. I was forgetting the name of my university in English, but we have a guest today. It's Professor Simon Thompson. Let me read here that you're working part-time at the University of Kent in, in, in the UK and also as a senior research lead at Input Output, which is a company that has a, a great web page. People should, should <laughs> go there. It's very, very beautiful. And you are leading the Marlowe team. And also you are working as an honorary doctor and professor of computer science at, uh, I sorry, my the people from Hungary, Hungary, Hungary. It's in Budapest. Budapest is Hungary, right? Budapest is Hungary, yeah, and it's it for Schlorant University. Okay, it was Schlorant University in Budapest, a beautiful, beautiful city. Yeah, Budapest. And so, thank you very much, Professor Simon Thompson. You can start your talk. Okay. Well, and thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's it's a great pleasure to um, to give a talk in Brazil. It's I was saying before before the call started. I lived in Brazil for a while. I lived in uh, Recife in in Pernambuco in the late 1980s, and I loved living there. So it's a pleasure to give a talk in Brazil. It would be even more of a pleasure to give it to you face to face, but that's that's something we're not allowed to do these days. Um, so thank you for the invitation, and thanks to everyone in the audience for coming. So what I wanted to talk about um, was was to try and give a present a small example, which shows a number of the things that Erlang and functional programming in general provide. So I'm concentrating on the functional programming side of Erlang rather than the the concurrent. Um, so it, it's just to 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 warn you of that to start with, but it it gives a chance to. Um, to talk through in a single example a number of the different techniques that Erlang provides um, and functional pro programming provides in general. So, um, and, and I think it's a really quite fruitful example. So, where we are with um, with that is that at least to start with, let me talk about languages because it's something that almost out everywhere in computer science, um, <clears throat> people often write some code that handles a little language. Um, this Adolfo mentioned that that I um, I've worked on Marlowe. Marlowe is a domain specific language for describing financial contracts. So it's a small language which you can use just to describe one, one part of the world. But you know in 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 looking say at the word the, the the web world there are languages like XML and SOAP and REST and HTML5 all of which describe interfaces or describe ways that um, text is set out. There are text processing languages. There are systems, um, systems like Make and more modern systems, which allow us to, to describe how to build a system. There are systems for data analy analytics, systems for testing. Um, and so often what we have to do what what software engineers have to do is process these languages um and that's as well as there's a whole other area of, of good old-fashioned compilers um this is it, that used to be a subject that was at the heart of computer science i think people teach it perhaps less than than they used to 20 25 years ago um but even if you're never going to have to think about designing a compiler, you will probably find that you're working with a language some way or another. And so the, the techniques I show you aren't just for my example, but can be generalized to all sorts of other areas. But what I'm going to take as an example is a really quite simple, quite straightforward example. It's something that, that maybe um, we learned in primary school, that we, we learned that you could write down, you had sums that you had to do. Um, so you could write down the expression like two plus three times four. And that's a, a numerical expression that is a very simple sort of computation. 
Um, or another, you can write down something a bit more a bit more complicated. That is two plus three times v, where v is a variable. So the language I'm going to talk about are these uh, expressions. So just to be the first thing to say, I'm not talking about numbers. I'm talking about, if you like, descriptions of numbers. So it's a language. We're going to focus on the language and what you can do with that language. So if I have an expression, what things can I do with that? Well, the first thing you can do is evaluate it. So if you get the expression two plus three times four, then it's something, it has a value because the way it's bracketed, we first work out the three times four, which is 12, and then we add the two that gives it 14. So we've taken that expression, that complicated thing, and produced a single number out of it. And if somebody tells me that V stands for minus two, then if I evaluate two plus three times V, its value is, well, the three times V is three times minus two is minus six. And so two plus minus six is minus four. So one thing you can do with an expression is either give it a value straight away, like I did with two plus three times four, or if somebody tells me what the variables mean, I can give it a value outright. Um, so we can take one of these expressions, these descriptions, and turn it into a number. So that's one, one thing we can do. Um, we can also do, do other things. Um, we can do what's called simplifying an expression. So this is different. It's taking an expression and making it as simple as we can. So <clears throat> what I've written here is 0 plus 1 times v. Now, whatever v means, 1 times v is the same as v. And whatever um, v means, 0 plus v is the same as v. So we can simplify that whole thing just to v. But what we're doing there is taking one description, one expression, and turned it into another expression. Um, and I could do that. I didn't know, need to know what the value of v was there. I could just do that, that simplification like that. Um, so that's, uh, that's another thing. We could turn them into a number. If we've got enough information, we can simplify them. But we could also do something. Another thing you can do with an expression is you can compile it into another language. Um, and so accept my word for this. We'll talk about it a bit later on. I can produce a machine, which is a simple stack virtual machine, that if I perform, if I can turn that expression into these instructions for that machine, and they will have the same, they'll have the same effect. So instead of having an expression, I've got a sequence of, of machine instructions, if you like. So I can turn an expression into a sequence of, of lower level instructions. And that's not giving me a value straight away, but it's giving me another program that I could run to get the value. Um, so those are three of the things. Just, just going back briefly, we can evaluate them, get a value. We can simplify them, make a simpler expression. We can compile them. So those are three things we can do. And this is why this is a nice example. So starting with the expressions, we can do those at least those three different things. And they're all quite different. You know, here we're producing a number. Here we're producing another expression. Here we're producing, ooh, I don't know, a a sequence of machine instructions. So those are those are things we can do. So, but the key question we have to answer here is, what does it mean? How do we represent these structures? Um, because that two bracket two plus three times four is a structure. So, remember what we're we're, we're thinking. We're thinking that these expressions are things like. 2 plus 3 times 4, or 2 plus 3 times v, where v is a variable. Um, do, raise, do raise a hand if anything comes up and you want to ask a question. Don't feel that you have to wait for me to go right to the end. Do raise a hand if you want to. And I'll, and if I'm, if I'm not seeing your hand raised, Adolfo, just, just tell me I, I, I need to stop. 
I've got, I, I think I can see you um, on the side of my screen, so that should, that should be okay. So how do we represent these things? So the first, the first, perhaps the simplest way of representing them is as, as a string, you know, we could say two plus three times four. Well, let's represent it as a string. So it's a string with open parenthesis two plus three times four, close parenthesis, close parenthesis. Anyone like to say why that's a bad idea? Would anyone volunteer an answer why that's a bad idea? Because you don't have a well-defined structure. Exactly, yeah. Thank you, Lewis. That's great. Yes. So the only structure there is in that string is that one character follows another. So you have a parenthesis, then a two, then a plus, then a parenthesis. It doesn't tell you anything. But what we want to do somehow is represent that structure. We want to see from the way it, it's represented in the computer that it's the addition of two things. There's two on the left-hand side, three times four on the right. And we want to see that three times four itself is a, is a multiplication. So what we want to do is somehow represent it something like this. This is a picture of, of what that structure looks like. At the top, the top level thing that you see there is a plus. That's the top level. On the left, you've got just the number two. On the right, you've got something else, some bit of structure, which starts off with a multiplication, and then it's a three on the left and a four on the right. So if you like pictorially, that would be that's how we want to think about these things. You know, that they're um they're like these trees. They they are definitely structured. You have a thing at the top, and then you've got subsidiary things underneath. But we can't do that directly in Erlang. So what we do is this, and this is perhaps you know where where um I'm showing things which look a bit different from Elixir. So I'm just drawing this again um, with some color on it to, to show you how that turns into something in Erlang. We use Erlang tuples, and we say we use the first element of the tuple, which is an atom, to say what kind of data it is. Now, if we were in a different language like Haskell, this would be a data constructor, um, but in Erlang, you roll your own, you define your structure types for yourself. Um, but we can read this, and what you have at the top level is a tuple with three components. It has the add component, and then the second component is this, which represents the number two, and the third component is another, a bit more complicated piece of structure, which starts off with a mull and then has number three and the number four. So we represent this tree-like structure by these nested tuples. This says what kind of structure it is, and then the remaining components give you the components underneath. So we've got an add of a number and this structure, which is multiplication of number and number. Um, so that's how, and then you can see if somebody gives you a piece of data like this, you can see just by looking at the first element what sort of data you've got. Um, and as I say, in different languages, those might be there might be built-in constructors which construct algebraic data types. But in as it stands in Erlang, that's how we how we represent them. Um, so that's kind of and and. In Erlang, again, you can write a, a type um, describing what an expression is like. And this says, we've got a type of expressions, and they are one of four things. They either have a label num and an integer, a label add and two expressions. We just saw one of those. A label mul and two expressions. We saw one of those. And then last, it can be, it can be a label var and just an atom. So those are the four, and this tells you quite clearly, an expression is either a number or a variable or an addition of two expressions or a multiplication of two expressions. So that's, that's describing the, um, the data type. So we use data type, a data type like this, and I guess the crucial thing to, to see about this data type is it's recursive. 
So in explaining what an expression is, I use the the I use expression. So I'm saying an expression can be an addition of two sub-expressions, two other expressions. It can be a multiplication of two expressions. Or with no recursion, it's just a number, uh, it's a num followed by an integer. So there's our type of expressions. Um, and then we've got two more things we can do with expressions. We can we can discover the structure in an expression. So we can in, in a string. So we can go from this string, open parenthesis two plus open parenthesis three plus, etc., to this structure. It's an add of a num and a mul of two nums. That's called parsing. Going from the flat structure, the flat non-structure, the flat sequence to something with structure is called parsing. Going in the reverse direction from add a number and a multiplication to this string, open parenthesis two, is called pretty printing. So we've got a network of things we can do with expressions. We can turn strings into expressions, which we can evaluate or compile. We can also take expressions, simplify them, and then turn them back into strings, for example. So going moving between those various different types of strings, expressions, numbers which are values programs which are the sequences of of um instructions and different things we can do um and they'll illustrate different kinds of recursion different kinds of of processing and that's why i think this is a nice it's a nice example um and you can look at this you know i've got examples if you're interested i'm happy to share them examples of this same lecture in haskell and in ocaml so that you can see how these same features work across different sorts of programming languages. Um, so, end of the second section. We talked. I talked in the first part about um, um, motivating you know, what the language was, what we could do with it. In the second section, we decide. We decided here's a way of representing expressions. Okay, Sam, I, I read, and also remind me, I'll send the, I can send examples in Haskell and, and OCaml. Yeah, fine, I'll do that. And I think I can send you a copy of the lecture as well in Haskell. So let me, let me do that. Um, let me write myself a note. Okay, but let's, let's start off um, and see how we can do pr perhaps the simplest example, or one of the simpler examples is pretty printing. So let's, let's just, work through that slowly <clears throat> so we, what we want to do is take one of these structures and turn it flatten it down just to a string of characters and as you can imagine it's probably easier going from structure to flat string than it is going from string to structure the structure guides us to what to print rather more than the the um the string I mean, the information is there, but sometimes it's hidden. Um, it's less obvious. Okay. So, and just to talk about the way that recursion works, and I'm sure you, you know you've seen this before, but to talk about the way recursion works, you can think of um, of doing it bottom up. So you start at the bottom of the tree and turn things into strings so that would have us turning the number two into the string two the number three into the string three the number four into the string four and then we can start pushing information up the tree so if we know what string represents that and what string represents that we can build a string for this we take the three and put a parenthesis in front sorry and then a, a multiplication then the four, then a closing parenthesis. And then we can take this two and this this three times four, and we combine them with a bracket, the two, a plus, the whole bracket, and then the, the closing parenthesis. So we can flow the information up the tree. Or, and this is, so one way of thinking about recursion is going up from components to the, 
um, whole structure. The second thing we can look at is to work top down. Can we can say, if I'm at the top of the tree, how would I go about printing the whole thing? Well, the answer is this, that I would do something like this. I'd print a parenthesis, then I'd have to get some information from the left, then I'd print a plus symbol, then I'd have to get the information about how to print the thing on the right, and then I'd finally print a closing parenthesis. So I could say, if, you know, I can print the whole thing, if I know how to print the thing on the left and the thing on the right. And you can see that if I'm given those things, if I'm given the thing on the left is two, and I'm given the thing on the right is parenthesis three times four parenthesis, then I can use that and that to give me what I have at the top. So there, going top down is a bit more complicated, but it's what we often do in practice. We say, if only I had information at the top, you know, information of these subcomponents, I could, um, I could do that. And yes, you're right. Oh, I'm not sure I can respond. No, I won't try and respond to chat while I'm talking. But yes, folding is right. You're, you're quite right. Um, so that's the sort of abstract way that we do this. But let's look at let's look now at what it means in practice um, for Erlang. So what we want to do is we want to take a, one of these expressions and print it. So we, if we print an expression, we get a string. So what I'm writing here, this is how in Erlang you say, I'm specifying that the print function takes an expression and gives back a string. Um, but how do we do that? Well, the first, the first step is to say, what could the input look like? And because I described earlier on what an expression, what the expression type was, I know the expression will either be a number with some n there, a variable, and some value I'll match with a, or an add with two sub-expressions, or a mull with two sub-expressions. So I can start off by saying I know this is the template for for this definition. And then I can start filling these parts in. If I'm printing this representation of a number, what I need to do is take out the number, which we're calling n here, and turn it into a string. So I use the built-in function integer to list. In a similar way, what I have here is an Erlang atom. So what I need to do is turn that atom into a string. And I do that with atom to list. So that deals with my two base cases, the things that can be at a leaf. And then what do I do to, to print out this addition? What have I got here? I've got an, a, an expression plus another expression. So how do I print that out? The answer is I print a left parenthesis and then join what I get by printing E1 with a plus and what I get by printing E2 and then finally add a closing parenthesis on the right. And here, this mirrors exactly what I was saying earlier. You know, this says I can print the whole thing if I can print the first sub-expression and the second sub-expression. And the way recursion works is that if we do that, then when we evaluate this, it will either be one of these base cases or it will itself break down again. And finally, you can guess it's not difficult to know how to print the mole. It's exactly the same, except we print a multiplication operator there. So that's a definition. Um, <clears throat> and I would call that, I mean, there's, there's various ways you could, you could describe it. I call it direct recursion. So I'm directly describing the answer for printing this complex add E1, E2 using print of E1 and print of E2. So I directly use those values and combine those values into something bigger. Um, now, that's one, that's one observation. The second observation, which I think is really neat, um, and, and 
different, I think, from um, what what we see in something like Java, what we see in an imperative language. I can just use these definitions as a way of evaluating an example. What I mean by that is, is here. I can I can actually work it out. If I if I want to print this, what this expression means as a string, um, what can I do? I've written down this print, this whole expression. One of these clauses of the definition will allow me to write one step of the evaluation. And because I have an add in this position, I can use this clause. So this tells me if I have an add of one expression and another, what I do is replace it with what you see there. So in that case, what we get is we have to print num of two, and we have to print this multiplication. And then I can play that same game again. I can say, oh, look, here's print num of two. This tells me what to do. And to print the null, this clause tells me what to do. So I can use both of those. Actually, I can do it in parallel here. Another advantage of functional programming, you can evaluate bits of an expression in parallel. That print number two turns into two. This turns into another complicated mess of parentheses and so on. I can rewrite that, the print num three and print num four, to give me three and four, and hey presto, I can join all these things together and that gives me two plus three times four. Now, I don't, I don't think that's the way we always want to do things. It's, but here it just shows you that you can take a definition like this and write out step by step, you've got this high level evaluation of what, what you can do. Um, I'm not going to do any more of these, but the point is it's always a way of working when you have a functional program. Okay, so, so what we've done is work through this particular example of printing. We can take one of these structures and turn it into a string. Perhaps that's the least exciting example. Now I'm going to move on to some more some more examples. But any any questions before I move on? Everyone happy so far? Great. Okay. So what I want to talk about now is um, <coughs> evaluating expressions. How do you go from an expression to the number that it represents? And the answer is, it can be complicated. Um, and I'm going to give you two ways of doing it. So the first way of getting an answer is to directly to evaluate it. So we've got this structure, we turn it directly into a number. And you could call that, if you were talking about um, programming languages, you call that an interpreter. You take the program and you, you directly get it to do something. Excuse me. But there's another thing we can do. The second thing we can do is to compile it into this different language and then execute the program that we produce. And um, what we'd like to do um, and what we can do in this case, I'm not going to, it's not something I'm going to show you, um, is that you can prove that if you do a direct evaluation and if you compile then execute, if the, pro, if the expression is a properly formed expression, you get the same answer whichever way you go. Um, but I just want to, what I want to do here is show you the pattern of what we mean by evaluation and compiling and execution, because those each give you a different sort of recursion. Um, <clears throat> okay, but let's let's start with evaluation. Um, so the, the function to do evaluation we call eval, um, and eval applied to an expression gives us an integer. So let's let's see what we're what we can do. Well, if I have something representing the number 42, then the, the answer is 42. If I have an expression which is the addition of one expression on the left and one expression on the right, the answer is what? We evaluate E1, maybe a big expression, say it turns out to be 10, we evaluate E2, the other side, which turns out to be 20, then the whole overall result is 10 plus 20 
the overall result is 30. So we evaluate the left-hand side, we evaluate the right-hand side and add the two together. And in exactly the same way, if we have a multiplication of one expression and another, we evaluate the left-hand side, evaluate the right-hand side and multiply the two together. So again, what you've got here is a direct recursion. It's saying, depending on what sort of expression you've got, if you've got a number, the answer is n. If you've got an addition, you evaluate each side. Whoops. And um, sorry. And, and if it's a multiplication, you evaluate each side and um, multiply the results. Now you can see this. I can animate this calculation. The evaluation of the value of each of these is the value the representation of two values to two, three to three, four to four. Then three times four is 12, and two plus 12 is 14. So that's how we get a result there. But imagine we have this expression. We've got 2 plus 3 times a. What's the value of that? Well, the answer is we can't give it a value because it has this variable here. So we have to change what we're doing and change a number of things. And what I'm doing here is showing you how we have to change the answer I gave just back here. What I said here to evaluate a number, just return the number, to evaluate addition of two expressions, just evaluate each one and add, and so on. What I want to say now is a bit more complicated. So what we're going to have to do is in order to feed into our evaluation, we need to know what value to give to variables. And we call this an environment. So here, I'm representing that like this, as a, this is a list of pairs. So this is a list which says A is paired with 23, i.e. interpret A as 23, and V is interpreted as 17. And so, and I'm going to imagine I got a, a function to look up the value of a variable in that list. And I said, an environment is a list of these atom integer pairs. And now when I do an evaluation, I've had to add another argument to eval. I don't just take an expression, but I also take the environment which tells me what value to give to a variable. And that will give me an integer back. And how do I use that eval? Well, the answer is, in the first case, I just ignore it. I don't care what's in there. I know that the number, a pair num, comma, 42, has the value 42. That's fine. But if I hit a variable a, the answer to what value it has is got by looking up a in the environment. I haven't defined that yet, but this is another nice piece of programming um, technique, just pretend you've got that function and define it in a second. So that deals with variables. What about now dealing with addition? Well, we just have to make one change here. We say we're doing the addition in this environment, which tells us what A is and B is and so on. When we evaluate E1, the two, the sub-expressions, we use the same environment. So we pass that information down. So this environment never gets changed, just gets passed down. And then we'll use it when we hit a num, not when we hit a num, only when we hit a var case inside E1 somewhere or E2. We do the same there. So I presented it like this because, you know, just showing you in two stages, the simple case, you know, the, the, um, the first approximation, we just take an expression and get an integer. That works for numbers, additions, and multiplications. But it, when we introduce variables, we have an extra clause to handle a variable. And also, we have to pass that environment around. Um, so we got a more, slightly more complicated function here that at the top level, we're doing a recursion. We do a pattern match on, um, on the expression. So we have four cases, that case for an expression, that case for an expression, that case for an expression, that case for an expression. 
In the case of a variable, we then call the function lookup. And the lookup will probably do something different. And we'll see that now. What lookup will do is lookup will break apart the environment. So lookup does a recursion over the list. Because what we've got here is what the environment looks like is a list of pairs which have an atom and, oops, sorry, an atom and a number. So we're saying atom and number. And now we've got to ask the question, we define the function lookup, which takes an atom and an environment, one of these lists of pairs, and it will give us back an integer. And now let's have a look at, at um, how this works. And what I'm doing here is starting to use some of the more complicated aspects of pattern matching in Erlang. And this is where definitions can get really short and concise and um, easy to read, I think. Um, what this says is, if you've got a case, we're looking for this atom. If you've got a case where the first element of the list is a pair whose first element is the atom we're looking for, we're using a repeated variable in that pattern, A is the thing I'm looking for, and I've got that same value in the first element here, then the answer is just the thing it's matched with. So it finds the first pair. So if, if I was looking for a small a, it would return the answer 23. And I don't care, I have a, a wildcard there. I don't care what the rest is because I just, I don't ever look in the rest. On the other hand, if this didn't hold, so if the atom was not the same as the atom in the first pair, I just look up, up a in the rest. And you will remember from when Laura was talking two weeks ago, what, one thing that Erlang programmers tend to do is they, they don't mind things failing. So if, um, if, for example, I applied this to the case where I looked up foo in, a, um, in an environment where foo wasn't defined, I would get a failure. Um, I've not tried to, to give an answer for that. And that's a pattern that particularly in... Um, It's a pattern for handling function calls that says the responsibility for this causing an error is not the responsibility of the person who defined lookup, it's the responsibility of the person who called it. So the lookup function shouldn't try and handle this. What we want to do is get the, the caller to make sure that, that they only call lookup in the case where it will not fail, i.e. the case where that variable does occur in, sorry, that atom does occur in one of those lists. So we're, what we've got here is, is um, that completes our definition of evaluation. So we've got um, the four clauses for evaluation and we've got, um, we've got that definition lookup. And again, that, so this is using a, a, um, a definition of, uh, of lookup, which does recursion over the, the list. And you can see there's no case there for an empty list. That will automatically fail if you apply it to an empty list. <clears throat> OK, I'm just going to take a 30 second break while I go and get myself a glass of water. Um, but I will be back in 30 seconds. Okay, let's just wait. And I have sent the code to the students. If, if the, the guests here want to see it, a link to the code here, I hope Simon doesn't don't, doesn't yeah, Simon doesn't mind because he sent me the file, but I put here to make it easier to share the code. It's back. Hi, I'm back. Thanks very much. Any questions before we go on? Is that, is that all clear? Great. So that was a direct recursion um, over the structure of the um, structure of expressions. Great. OK, so we've got one way of evaluating expressions. We take an environment and we decompose that expression and recursively give its value. Great. OK. 
but let's think of doing this on in a different way so i'm going to try and and this is you could call this compiling what we're doing is taking an expression which is one sort of program and turning it into a list of instructions which is a program for a different kind of machine um and so you know this is the second route here it's we compile and then we execute so let's think what's going on here um let me explain the the setup and then we'll think about how to do it in erlang <clears throat> so the idea this is a virtual machine it's virtual in a sense it's not it's not it's not a piece of hardware it's um it's a conceptual machine but it's it's very simple it has a stack um and then and what happens is is the instructions do things manipulate the stack so for example if we have the instruction push n it pushes the integer n onto the top of the stack so in pictures here what you can see is on the left is the stack before it has three and seven on top if i perform the instruction push eight it has three seven on top and then eight on top of that and the idea is a stack you build it up by putting elements on top and you you again decompose it by taking elements off the top um, so that's what push does um, we've got an instruction fetch which takes the value of a variable from an environment if you like which is a, a high level of abstraction for the, for if you like the, the, the store of a computer so if we do if we perform fetch a it looks up a in the store finds its value is four and sticks that on the top of the stack and then if we perform an addition instruction what that does is take the top two elements off the stack adds them together and puts the result on top so it takes eight and seven off the stack and replaces them with 15. and you can imagine that mull takes the top two elements off the stack and replaces them by their product so eight and two get replaced by 16. <coughs> so those are the four instructions so what the program does is it, it puts it's a stack of numbers which can grow and shrink um, according to those four different kinds of instruction okay um so then we've got to think on here let, let me just show you an example so this is an example we start off with an empty stack um what we do first is we push number two onto there we push the number three we fetch a which happens to be four we uh, perform a mul multiplication instruction which replaces the top two elements by their product which gives us 12 and then we replace we perform an add which replaces the top two elements by their sum which is 14. So you can see the stack grows as we push and fetch and then reduces as we do instructions on it. Now, this is a, a, a very simple machine, um, but the point is not so much that the machine is um, is interesting, but the the programs that we write to implement it, to implement the compiling, to implement the execution are, are themselves perhaps a bit more interesting. So let's see. Let's see what we have to do. Well, again, a bit like what I did with expressions. The first thing you've got to think about is how what types you're going to use. Um, so this is sort of type directed programming. We need to think how to model these different kinds of objects, these different kinds of thing. And so um, we need to think how to model a particular single machine instruction. We have to model how to run the machine. What's it mean to run that machine? And we have to think how we're going to compile an expression into a sequence of instructions. So and we need to think about how to represent a sequence, but I guess that's not so difficult to work out. So <clears throat> here's my here's how I'm going to represent instructions. I'm either going to I'm going to have a pair, which is a push. And an integer or a fetch and an atom and or something to add two numbers or something to multiply two numbers 
and then a program is going to be a list of instructions. I, I talked about a sequence earlier, but Erlang has lists built in, so I'll model those as a list. And finally, I'm going to model the stack as a list as well. And this is perhaps another example of how, how valuable lists are as a data type. You can use them for sequences of things, you can use them for, for stacks, you can use them for collections. They're a really helpful, um, you know, really all-purpose data type. And then we're going to, to compile. Our, our, our compiler will be something that takes an expression and gives us a program, which is a sequence of instructions. And then I'm going to write a function called run, which takes a program and an environment. This environment, remember, is a thing that takes you from an atom to a number. And that will give us an answer, which will be an integer. Um, now, in fact, what I'll do, and you'll see, you'll see why when I start defining it, I'm going to have to define a more general function, not one that takes just a program and an environment. But what run does, this is running a program where you've already built up a stack. So the, the, the two argument run is one that starts off with an empty stack. But once you're halfway through running a program, you'll be running that program essentially with a stack that's already built. So that's why, in general, I need this three argument run function. OK, and here is here. Let's talk. Let's talk about how the stack machine runs. And this gives us a very different pattern of recursion. Um, and what it gives us is what's called tail recursion. And you'll see how this how this works in a second. So let's have a look. I, what I've got is of, of five different cases here. And what I'm doing is I'm pattern matching on the program. And I'm saying, in the first four cases, the program is non-empty. It's either begins with a push or a fetch or an add or a mull. And in the last case, the program has finished. There's no instructions in the program. So that's my, that's my, um, First argument, I do pattern matching over what the next instruction is. But also, you can see I'm doing a bit of pattern matching lower down as well. I'm saying when I do an add to instruction, I pattern match on the first two elements of the stack. So I'm writing a pattern which will only be valid. I can only validly run an add to instruction if there's at least two things on my stack. And if I don't, I'm going to fail again. But you know, the let it fail philosophy applies again. Um, so I'm using, I'm doing, if you like, the recursion is on the, the first element, but the I'm also doing some auxiliary pattern matching to pull things out of the stack on the second. Now, what does it mean to push? Um, the number n. Well, what happens is if we push the number n, we're left with the rest of the program, which matches to continue. So what running that program will be the same as running this. So to run a push command followed by continue, what we do is put n on the stack and then run continue. So what I'm doing here is what's called tail recursion, because the, the recursion on the, the call on the left is the same. The result is a, another call to that same function. And one way you can view that is it's a bit like doing an assignment, where I have three variables, and I um, and I change the values in those three variables um, according to what's there on the left hand side and what's there on the right. So you can see there my push instruction has been removed from the, the program and I've added the n to the beginning of the stack. Now, what about the fetch? Well, a fetch is going to be pretty much the same, except what we put on the top of the stack is what we get by looking up in the environment. So 
you should expect to see that here. And you can see it's a, exact, exactly the same pattern as we had there. Instead of putting N on the top of the stack, we've looked up A in the environment and put that on the stack. And then we run the remainder. So it's, it's this tail recursion that the answer to the recursive call is another recursive call with different values in the parameters. And what, what about adding two numbers together? Well, in our arguments, we've got a stack with at least two things that we're calling n1 and n2. What add2 should do is remove those from the stack and replace them with their sum. And that's what we see here. We run the continue program, and the, the stack we run it in has n1 plus n2 on the top. And so again, it's not so hard to see in the case of multiplication that we do the same thing. OK. Now, in each of these calls, each recursive call is another recursion. So when does this ever stop? The answer is it stops when we hit the end of the program, when there are no more instructions to, to evaluate. And we're assuming that we do, we're hitting that state with one thing on the stack. And the thing on the stack is the answer. And that's what we give. So that is describing how to run each of those. Um, so a single step, if it's a push, we've put the value on the top of the stack. If it's a fetch, we put the lookup on top of the stack. If it's an add, we put the sum of the top two elements on the stack. If it's a mole, we, we put the product of the top two elements. And in each case, we then run the remaining program with that new stack. OK, happy so far. So now we've got our stack machine. Now we have to think about how to compile. Um, and what I've done here is, is show you how to compile. Um, and I've not done this in four stages. I've just, um, I've just compiled it as it is now. What I'm doing here is showing you, and remember what compiling is, is taking an expression and turning it into a program. And that program is a list of instructions. So the program to compute the number n is the program that pushes n onto the stack. The program to compute the variable a is the program that fetches a from the environment. The program to compute addition of E1 and E2 compiles E1, that's a list of instructions, adds to the end of that result of compiling E2, and then sticks at the end of that, that whole list of instructions, the add to instruction. So what this will do when you run it is to evaluate E1, put the result on the stack, then evaluate E2, put the result on top, and then take those two values off and add them. In a similar way, we get that with E1 and E2. So um, that gives us those three. And you can see here, um, again, this is a direct recursion. And uh, Letitia is saying, when we run add to and add, yeah, that's exactly what we do. If we go back to here, that you can see that's what's happening here. When you evaluate, the, when you perform the add to instruction in a stack whose first top two elements are n1 and n2, this is a, a pattern in Erlang that says the first element matches n1, the second element matches n2, and the rest of the list is that. What we return is a list whose head is n1 plus n2, whose tail is stack. Sorry, it, it's this is where the Erlang, perhaps where the Erlang uh, syntax gets a bit more complicated. This matches element one, element two, and then the rest of the list. Um, and this forms a list whose first element is n1 plus n2, and the rest of it is the stack. So this is the thing that constructs a list from its head and its tail. 
but thanks for the question. Um, okay, um, and I could, yeah, good. But that's that's a that's a very helpful question. Um, okay, <clears throat> and so I think what I what I've tried to to um, to get across here is you know, we use flexibility. We use lists in a number of different ways. And also we can use, we just use tuples in Erlang to, to represent different kinds of data, to represent simple machine instructions, to represent structures like expressions. We have actually defined types and we've specified types, specified function types. We've used pattern matching. And in some places we've pushed that quite hard. Here, we're just doing a simple thing. We're just pattern matching on a single expression and then using its components on the inside the definition. But here we're doing some more complicated pattern matching where you know, we're matching two elements on the top of the stack. Um, and we're, we're ma pattern matching over two lists here. This is the list that represents the program. This is the list that represents the stack. And we're doing matching a constant element there and matching variables there. So it is, it's really quite flexible um, as, a, as a notation for, and it means you can write very compact definitions in a, in a small amount of space. Uh, now, of course, you could do this entirely without pattern matching. And if you, because um, <clears throat> all the pattern matching there is in something like OCaml is inside expressions, you can't do it at the, it's a pattern in a line because of the linked list store. Um, the pattern for lists is, is like this because the first trial interpreter for Erlang was written in Prolog and it inherited this notation for lists from Prolog. Um, and probably, I mean, maybe people uh, you know, are, are unhappy about that. I, I could, if you just, if you hang on one second, if I stop presenting, I can share. Just to, if I blow this up a bit. I've got an Erlang window here. You can see if I write something like two vertical bar three um, and print that out, it prints, oh, it's printing out two. Oh, of course, no, I'm being an idiot. Sorry, forget that. If I write something like this, this is, um, this is a list. Because that is actually shorthand for three stuck on the front of the empty list. So I build I build lists by having, if I say head is two and tail is is the list three comma four. Then if I put these two together, I put I say head stuck on the front of tail or head cons tail. Um, Then you can see that's built a list whose head is is two, and the rest of the list is three comma four. And I, in fact, I could show you that another way. Um, I could say match head tail. Whoops. Ooh. Against two comma three comma four. And I would, if I asked what head was now. I get the answer two, and if I ask what tail was, I get the answer three comma four. So there, I'm doing a pattern match of this list pattern against a an actual list. Does that help? Sorry, let me go back to where am I meant to be? In is that okay? I'll go back to my. Um, I'll go back to my. Um, Oh, screen share. Give the hang of this a bit. Right. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> we talked about pattern matching, and then I made this point about, about tail recursion. Um, and perhaps I didn't make that terribly well, but tail recursion is like um is very like imperative programming. Um, and I don't I didn't have a, a proper slide about that, but it is like going into a a tail recursive function is like a loop where you keep changing the values of variables till you stop recursing. Um, but I would argue 
in a sense, I mean, you could, you might disagree, but I'm going to say it anyway. This sort of program is quite easy to understand. It says, here's how to compile a number expression. Here's how to compile a variable expression. Here's how to compile an addition expression. All you need to you think about how you compile E1 and how you compile E2 and how you combine them all together. So you can sort of understand that statically. You can say, OK, compiling the whole thing, I have to compile the components. Fine. It's harder to understand what this does because this call to run is explained to be another call to run. And that's true in each of these cases. So anytime I call run, it's going to call run again and again and again and again. Each time the program is going to get shorter till finally we hit um, we hit the base case. But before that, I'm going to, oh, thanks. I'm going to, you know, I call run and I call run. And so this push, if you think that the first slot gets turned into that, the end doesn't change, the stack changes. And I, I do that time and time and time and time again, run calls, run calls, run calls, run. And then I get, I fall out of the function. It's just like being in a loop in a functional language, uh, in a, an imperative language, I go round and round and round the loop until I fall out of the loop. So this is like imperative programming, not so easy to understand. You've got to understand the whole sequence that it goes through, whereas this says directly, well, to compile that, you compile the sub bits, stick them together. OK, that was it on tail, tail recursion. And again, missing cases, I'm just letting it fail. And if you pass in an expression that isn't properly formed, so you would be difficult to do that. The compilation would fail, and then probably running it would fail, but hard luck. OK. Um, here are some things you could think of doing if you get interested by this. There are lots more things you can do. Um, you could write a function that does the simplification. So again, why I like this example is that you can take it and build lots of things on top of it. So you could um, you could define a simplification function. In fact, Adolfo has my example code and that has some simplification stuff in there. So you could take a look at that and he'll share that with you. Um, you could put in more, I've just put addition and multiplication. You could do subtraction, division, you could, allow people to set variables inside an expression. So you like this let expression. It says let v equals e1 in e2. That's allowing you to do that. You could add booleans. You could change the syntax uh, if you wanted. Um, so there's lots of things you could add to this language. Now, <clears throat> I, I've got one more section, and then I can show you some examples. Perhaps the most difficult section to think of is, um, remember, we talked about how you could convert from an expression, one of these structure things, to a string, and that's called pretty printing. Going in the opposite direction is more complicated, um, usually, and that's called parsing. But in fact, it's not that much more difficult, and I can sum it up in a um, in quite a short, a short space. So let me... Give me a bit of time to talk through this, and then I will stop. Um, so the examples I would give you are things like this. We've got pars. We have the string. You know, I, 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 I'm not really good at thinking of new examples. Open parentheses 2 plus open parentheses 3 times 4, close, close. That turns into our old friend here, an add of the num and that mole. If I pass the string with just two in, I get number two. If I pass the string with just a in, I get variable a. What happens if I pass this string? What if I try and extract an expression from this string? Well, I can take two from the beginning, and that's an expression. So I can say the answer is none two. I'm looking to, to 
eat away at that string, then the, the biggest expression I can find at the beginning is, is the number two. But if I return that, I've lost everything which had not been processed. I found a number two at the beginning, but then I lose this whole remainder of the string. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a parse function that takes a string and it returns two things. It returns the expression it has found at the beginning of the string plus whatever is left over. So if I apply parse to this string, I get the expression we had before and an empty string remaining. If I parse the number two, I get number two plus an empty string remaining. If I parse this string, I get number two plus the rest of the list that hasn't been dealt with yet as a remainder. So I return a pair, which is an expression on the left and whatever is left on the right. So number two and that and that remaining string. And you know, if this is because we're doing functional programming, there are no side effects. Another way of doing this in a language where you could do things invisibly is you could somehow move the position of a pointer in a string buffer or whatever. But that is, we're not doing that. We're just, all we're doing here is defining functions that return results. So we say the result of parsing this string that begins with number two is that num2 is the expression we found and we part of the result is what's left. We'll see how we use that in a minute. Now, let me explain the parse algorithm doing this, this um, <coughs> informally. What are we looking for when we parse an expression in, in my simple language? We look for an opening parenthesis. You must begin with an opening parenthesis. We must then find an expression, which in this case is the number two. We must then find an operator, which in this case is the plus. We must then find another expression, which is three times four here. And then we must find the closing parenthesis. And we know at each stage what it is we're looking for. We look for a opening parenthesis, an expression, an operator, an expression, and a closing parenthesis. So it's, in the jargon, it's completely deterministic. At every point, we know what we're looking for. And that allows us to write this as a predictive top-down parser. And let's see, <clears throat> let's see how this works. And I'm using pattern matching here. So first of all, I'm saying, I'm assuming my input begins with the character open parenthesis. I signal that by putting dollar open parenthesis. It's the way you'd quote that in LA. So assuming it begins with open parenthesis, what do I do then? I first of all, I parse rest, and that will return a pair E1, which is the expression it's found, and the remainder, which I call rest one. Now, rest one must begin with an operator, first element of the string, and then have the rest two. What do I do with rest two? I look for an expression at the beginning of rest two by parsing it. That gives me expression two paired with rest three. What do I then do? I look for a closing parenthesis at the beginning of rest three and then whatever is left. So for this to six for each of these pattern matches to succeed, I've had to have an opening parenthesis, I've had to have an expression following, I've got to have an operator, I've got to have an expression following. Oops, oh sorry, oh I got the sorry, I've got some animation here. Yeah. Um, so I get an opening parenthesis and then an expression and then an operator and then an expression and then a closing parenthesis. And then what, what I return is depending on what the operator is, if it's a plus, 
I return an addition of E1 and E2. It's a multiplication symbol. I return multiplication. And in each case, I pair it up with the um, whatever is less left of the string. And so that gives me, and <clears throat> now it's interesting here that the, the structure of this recursion doesn't bear any relation to the structure of the string. It's the structure of the recursion mirrors the production rule of the grammar, which says you build an expression or one way of building a complex expression. So have an opening parenthesis, an expression, an operator, another expression, and a closing parenthesis. So in, in, in other cases, we're doing a recursion on a list or a tail recursion or recursion over structure. Here, the recursion is just weird. It's not really, um, it's guided by some external structure, which is the grammar, um, rather than it being guided by anything um, intrinsic to the data structures. So that's why it's, that's why it's a bit more complicated. Okay, so that gives us predictive parsing. And, um, okay. There's just one last thing we have to think about for, um, that was the different, you know, that was the structured bit. What about um, numbers? How do we recognize that we've got a number, the minus one, two, three, or we've got a variable, we've got a sequence of, 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 um, of letters. What we want to do always is to pull off the longest sequence of digits, one, two, three, or the longest sequence of variable uh, ends with a plus, this ends with a parenthesis there. Um, and uh, what we're going to do, and I haven't done much of this, um, but is, this is a, a, a chance to see a simple higher order function being used. I'm going to write a general function that takes the longest initial segment, so the longest front part of a list, which has a given property, and I represent that property as a function that takes an element of the list and returns a boolean. So get while takes a function from t to boolean and a list of t and gives us back two lists of t, the longest initial segment that has the property plus whatever is left. Um, and you know, it's really nice to have this, um, to be able to use what is a property. It's something that is either true or false for any particular element. So we represent it as a function. And so quite naturally, we've got a, a higher order function here, a function get while that takes a function as argument. Um, now, and, and you can see that to find a, um, To test for a small, we can write this function is alpha, it tests that its argument is bigger than or equal than the code for little a and smaller than or equal the code for little z. So this function is alpha is a test for something being a small letter. And so we, um, we use this get while function to, um, the fun is alpha, to give us the, the list of things in a variable and the remainder. <laughs> Okay, so that gives us um, that gives us our answer there, and a similar thing. And here's get while. Um, you can see an example here. Get while p from a list with uh, whose first element is ch and whose remainder is is rest. It's a case of whether P holds of CH. So we apply P to CH will be either true or false. If it's false, the answer is there's nothing at the beginning. And so the, the list, the longest list of things with that property at the beginning is empty. And um, we just return the original list as the remainder. Otherwise, we, um, we apply get while to, we know that CH has the property. So we try and find the longest initial segment in here. And that we match that with pattern matching to that result. And then we stick CH on the front of the, uh, the, the initial segment from the rest. Oops. Um, 
So again, a different pattern of recursion, which here is is guided partly by um, partly by the list, but also by this pattern match on um, this case switch on the value of the property. And this is this is a um, this is a sort of tail recursion here. So again, a different pattern of recursion. Okay, now I think that is that is pretty much where I wanted to stop. I've probably shown you far far too many examples, throw too much at you. Um, but just to remind you, there are these these whole slew more of things that you might like to look at. Um, and if you're if you're interested, you can extend the parsing function that I've written to some of these other these other examples. If you add some more operators, um, or you add new bits of syntax. Okay, and I think you know again trying to go back to that, this lessons learned just one more time. Yeah, how flexibly we can re re represent data just with lists and tuples. How useful pattern matching is for decide, defining the essence of a definition. Just the cases we don't talk about, we let it fail. Um, and these different kinds of recursion that in practice, um, you know, we combine direct recursion, tail recursion, doing extra bits of pattern matching on the side, putting those together give us a very flexible and powerful way of writing things down in a, in a very short and readable way. Um, that is that is it for me. Now I, I got, you know, I have an editor open um, where I could show you some examples. Um, yeah, I've blown it up a bit. I've got my expression, I've got my examples here, you know, you can see print, and I've, I've shared this with Adolfo, but you can see, for example, the parse function there. So I could, I've got it loaded here, so I could do um, express, expra, colon, parse of you know, the list that begins two plus, plus three, four, 23, close parenthesis, um, and you can see, I hope, it returns a number. It finds the longest number at the beginning of the list and returns the remainder. And so if I do an extra of pars of, of the only example I know, which is two plus three times four, you can see I return exactly the expression I would want to get and um, the empty list. And if I do this again, doing a pattern match, E, pattern match that against um, uh, I've now got, I've now matched E to um, Hopefully, let's see that E is matched, yeah. So E has matched that example expression. And so I could do something like um, expra colon um, val um, with an empty lookup table and E, I should get the answer 14. Whereas if I change this to, um, let's call it F, uh, <coughs> uh, underscore, Let's let's put in an example which is um, a variable in it. And then now we should. Okay, so we've got this expression capital F, which has a variable in it. If I do the same evaluation with, with F in there, it's going to fail. It's saying no function clause mapping lookup A. That's because very clearly. Um, I didn't give a value to A in my um, if I say give B the value 34, A the value 42 in my environment, and then call that again, I get the answer 128. Um, because A had the value 42, and if in an example where A has value 2, I get the answer eight um, you can see that uh there's eval working we could look at what um compile looks like uh, 
um, of f, let's see, divide of f, which gives something. And there we've got a we've got a um, a compile of f. And that's what we could then do is we could and let's call this let's call this program p. And now we've got a program for computing f. And let's call this thing n. This is another joy of functional programming, just having a this read evaluate print loop where um, you can just name things and play around with them. Sorry, let me move this up a bit. So now we've got um, we've got this expression. So let's 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 do this first of all. We'll do the eval. I call this thing env. So let's see what if we eval env in a, uh, f in the env we get eight. Compile f. So let's do. Um, but let's run this. What are we running? We're running the program p for f in the environment n, and we're starting off with an empty stack. Let's see what we get. Whoa, we get the right answer. We get the same answer. Um, so you can see this is just it's a demonstration that we get the same answer from running the compiled program as we got from evaluating it directly. Um, uh, just to to show you, and this this has the parse functions and so on. Um, uh, and there's compile and run and so on and so forth. Um, here's a bit of simplify. Just to to the last thing to talk about. What simplify does is take an expression, and give you back an expression. And this says, for example, if we apply simplify to adding the number zero to an expression well forget the number zero just simplify e1 you might be able to simplify we're removing the plus zero but we could simplify e1 potentially even more the same with multiplying e1 by one it's even better when we come to multiplying any expression by the number zero the answer is just the number zero. So we can simplify that without knowing what any expression at all times zero is zero. Um, and then we can, if we can't do anything else, we can, um, to simplify an add, we simplify each side and so on. So um, those are, that's one attempt at the simplify. Now, in fact, that's not, the best you can do better than that and simplify things more and i'll leave that as an exercise for you so how much more can you do to simplify than i have done there you can you can simplify things more aggressively than i have programmed in there and that's a good that i will will really stop talking now um and say are there any questions uh, so let me right i've stopped okay you have me my Full attention. Any questions? Okay, let's wait for the questions. I have a question. Why do they, they think about their, their question? I have a question that it's not directly related to your talk, but uh, because you have this talk prepared in Haskell or Camo and Erlang. Yeah. And I, I was looking for functional programming books, and most of them are tied to some language. So you, you yourself, you have written books on Erlang and Miranda and Haskell. Is there uh, any any functional programming book that's not related to a to a, a specific language that you know? That's a very good question. Um, I, one of I, my one of my favorite. Let me find it. Okay. Do you all know the Miranda language? Miranda was a language, a functional programming language from the past that some people really loved it. But it's, I believe, after Haskell was created, it 
made little sense for the creator to keep it uh, yes. evolving. So, so I can't find what I was looking for. Um, you can never find the book when you want to find it. Um, it's called recursive programming techniques. Oh, where is it? Uh, by Burge, B U R G E. I'm looking for it at on Amazon. That was in, it was a really early. It was written in the nineteen seventies and does have um, it has some really fantastic insights. And it was written really before there was a there's a little bit of risk in it, but it really is pretty well language agnostic. I have found it. It's on Amazon. Uh, a very old edition from 1975 but it's yeah. it's there that's, and that's it's, the only edition i think yes sorry i can't find it but I, I i would i don't know but that's a bit worrying i can't i can't look at where it's gone but anyway yeah it's a nice book and that had things you know that prefigured quite things that people rediscovered in the 80s and 90s and so on so he was one of the real pioneers so in that sense um and it wasn't, it was really there before people had, had languages that were easily usable. Um, yeah, so I think that's, but you're right. But I think there's, you know, there's a sort of philosophical thing there. Uh, that you know, It is good. It's quite hard to learn a language without having a way of, of, of executing it. It's, it's a good thing to have that execution environment there. So I think, yeah, I think it's, it's helpful to have. So I think, and, and, but the problem is, as, you, as perhaps you were hinting, that um, you, it, there's a bit of, of overhead in learning any particular language. So you've got to, um, you know, you, there's, the syntax is there that maybe gets in the way. And also, it, it, languages are different. So between, you know, between Haskell and OCaml, um, OCaml is strict, Haskell is lazy. So and you get different techniques come out in a lazy context than in a strict context. Um, and, and the arguments, it's not at all clear which one is, is better in general. Um, you know, some people say lazy because it's, um, it's more expressive in some ways. Yes, that's true. But in other ways, it's much harder to predict the space and time behavior of programs, particularly space behavior. And that's so serious because it's non-compositional. You only know how a program is or how a function is going to behave when you know how it's called. In, whereas in a language like OCaml or Erlang, you can predict how the function will behave. You know, without independent of its context, you know how it will behave. Whereas in, in Haskell or um, other lazy languages, you can only say something about behavior in context. And that means that you can't, it's quite hard to put together, you can only analyze your program by starting at the top and working downwards. You can't, you can't assemble pre-understood bits of, of understanding and put them together. So the way that components interact can be very um, unpredictable. So, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a substantial downside. And in practice, what the Haskell compiler spends a, a, an awful lot of time doing is predicting which bits of a program are, are in fact strict. And what's it can therefore evaluate? No, and in a sense, that's fine because what you're saying is it's a compiler's job to do that, not a programmer's job. Um, and that's that's okay, but it's there are still situations where the compiler can't do such a good job, or just the programmer's intuition is not is not um, is not immediately clear. And the bigger a program gets, bigger a system gets, the more complicated it is. Bruno. Hi. Hi. Um, what do you think about uh, the microservices uh, architectures and multiple languages and applications within the same axis, a, ecosystem and the rising of the functional programming languages in the 
uh, startups on okay, these days? It. There's a whole lot of questions in there. Um, I mean, I think one interesting thing is is now how much functional programming is part of the mainstream. So, you know, Java has has um, lambdas, for example, and you can see that there are there are strong reasons for doing that, even within an object oriented language. That it it allows you to write much better APIs, for example. That if you can parameterize something on a piece of behavior. And that's what that's what a lambda does. Really, it packages up a piece of behavior. It um, it allows you to do that in a in a succinct way, rather than having to use a, a class to wrap up that behavior. Why not just put the behavior inside an abstraction? So I think, and you so you know many languages now have have lambdas as as relatively um, first class things. So I think that's. It, it can be difficult though using functional programming some functional programming techniques within a broader context i mean you, because you can putting together different paradigms can make life difficult it's often helpful just to have one way of doing things um but sorry you were asking about microservices and i think you know microservices are a great example of, of you know, a, an abstraction behind which you can put many languages and that's that's a good thing i mean i think Finding appropriate abstractions is one of the one of the keys to 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 solving problems. Um, going on to startups using functional languages, um, you know, with my with my industrial hat on, um, it's interesting to see. It, it used to be the case that there were more people wanting to get functional programming jobs than there were functional programming jobs. I'm not sure that's the case any longer. So I think there are, if you're trying to recruit functional programmers, you're going to find it much harder now than you would have done three years ago. Um, now, I think that's, you could argue why that is. And there's, there's, there's a sort of, and there's an English phrase that says, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? And there is that sort of question here. I think one reason functional programming has become popular is that typically functional programmers have been among the more adventurous programmers you know, they're people who want to learn they're eager and perhaps that, that enthusiasm and and acuity is something that that makes them good good people to employ as programmers whatever language they're using and so functional programming has been the thing that um has attracted good programmers and has therefore meant that there's been a demand for people with those skills and i think we're hitting a point now where the demand is exceeding the supply. Um, the number of people who've got five years or you know, three years experience functional programming is is quite small, and quite a lot of people are chasing those. Because a lot of recruiters, you know, perfectly understandably, want to recruit people who are experienced, don't want to train people from scratch. Um, so I'm not sure. Did that, I'm not sure if that answered your exact question, but it was. It, it said some things about the the the. the Questions that you raised. You answered all all my questions. Thank okay, you. Cool. Well, thank you. Fine, Sam. Hi, Sam. Hi. Um, at Hi. one point, I had a look over the IOHK website, and it looked very. Nice. I don't know if that's how you say it. Um, in yes. production, or IOHK or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything interesting you can say about how all this stuff and and your work there kind of keys into, into, into this stuff? OK, that's a good question. I mean, I think it, <clears throat> that more, I mean, it's not the, not Haskell is not the only language that, that IHK use, but it's the, it's the principal language they use for programming their blockchain. And so it is, you know, IOHK employs a lot of Haskellers. And I think it's been, you know, it, it's proved to be a robust language for, um, for producing high quality software. You know, I think the abstractions that are available are, are good ones. Um, I think it, you know, I think it's it's proved to be a, a robust choice. I think that's um, you know that that's one lesson from from there. Um, I mean I suppose another lesson, and so that's for programming the basics of the blockchain, but also the the language Plutus is effectively Haskell transform to work on a on a blockchain so transform so 
what what IHK have done is is make Haskell, as it were, a language for writing smart contracts and distributed applications. Now that's in some senses that's been that's been very good and it's 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 a good like platform to use, but it's yeah, you know, there's some tension there with people saying we'd rather write in JavaScript or, or um, you know, a, a more widely available, a more widely known language. And so that's you could argue that's that's that, that's been a criticism that people have made. Um, so the people used to say, was it was it John Graham who wrote about using Lisp? That the way they used Lisp was it was their secret weapon. They didn't tell the people they were writing for they were using Lisp. They produced good software that that did what it should do, and you know, the fact it was written in Lisp was irrelevant. And and that's you know that that's I <clears throat> I think there's a lot in that. Um, you know, I, I think it's people can can obsess too much about about languages. Um, yeah, you know, there are a lot of there are other factors that go on in making software. Sustainable, you know, designing good interfaces, documenting things well, um, which are you know those, those things are perhaps less less sort of exciting, but they they can make a big difference in practice. So it's not, you know, it, it, it's I, <clears throat> it's a good choice. It's an interesting choice. It's a viable choice. Um, but clearly, people can be successful with lots of choices. Um, but I wouldn't, for example, I mean, the, I, just as a thought experiment, doing the sort of work, doing the sort of example in that I've done in, um, done for, for expressions there, thinking about doing that in Java, it's not, it, you can do it, there's nothing, you know, there, there, are, there are design patterns for doing that sort of thing. It's just not as elegant in Java, doing that sort of, Processing of structures like that, it's just not so elegant, um, and you know it becomes really quite complicated. If you, I didn't do anything, uh, but you can imagine if you wanted to write an equality function over um, over expressions, or say, is this expression a sub-expression of another one? Um, sometimes, if you want to navigate two structures simultaneously, then then the OO approach of using inheritance does get clunky. And then there are, and you can see now. There's no, there's no way around that. Um, but, but it can be true that that functional languages can be difficult to read. I mean, it's possible to write code that is is too abstract. It's too concise. It's um, you, know, you can put together a combination of high of operators, um, higher order operators, which together do something useful. But it, gosh, it's very difficult to know what they do. Um, even from reading off their type, which is um, which is crucial. But I think one one thing that I'd say for Erlang and Elixir that that and they they are they're nice languages and they have the ability the, the advantage of being substantially smaller than Haskell. And Haskell has been there as a what's you know what's funny about Haskell really is that it's been it's been a vehicle for research where you know, lot, particularly into types. Which is all, all is also being successful in production, and that's, I think, some of us, me included, are surprised that that succeeded. You know, it could have been, um, uh, but I, I think, and having talked and having used Erlang and Haskell, the one place where I think what would make could make Erlang really fly and Elixir really fly is to have a bit more some gradual typing, some some type a type system that really got a grip. Of of um, no, that dialyzer is not a, a proper type system. It's 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 a post hoc. It doesn't help you to write programs because of its success type model. Um, what you'd like is something that's a bit more that will be a bit more prescriptive about um, type errors and so on. And you could, and also having it built in, <coughs> building types into the into the language as it is designed, and into the um, into the compile into the compiler it, itself, it just makes life, you get a lot more feedback. You know, the fact you get squiggly line, you know, having that feedback built into Visual Studio Code, for example, when you've got type errors, that makes a big difference. Um, 
so i think you know that will be and i think that's going to come i think there's some people at facebook book have been looking at it in the whatsapp team and i think also Josef Svenningsen is looking at it independently i think that will come you know i think there are there are some good ideas about how to because you need a sort of gradual typing approach you don't want to force types on everything but you want to when something is typed you want to make sure it's used in a in a proper way and that I think pushing i think that pushing that through is is entirely possible you know many uses of list functions are going to be many uses of library functions are going to be typed and it's so easy particularly for beginners to confuse a list of list of integers with a list of integers and Erlang will allow you to push that confusion quite a way down the line um, before before it fails. Um, yeah, okay, but that's yeah. I'm going to stop now. I think I'm. But does that give you? Does that answer your question? Yes, it was a it was a bit of a, a broad a broad question. So sorry about that. But yes, it was. It was Good. Thank you. Good. Okay. Thanks. Cool. We have a question from Pietro. Pietro, do you want to ask or do you want me to ask your question? Oh, I see. So the, the question is, is there any situation where in Erlang you have to prefer tail recursive style for recursion instead of direct recursion? Um, OK, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think the example of running the, the program was one of those. So um effectively what what you're doing there is you iterate you're iterating along along the um along that list and just just reinvoking that you're 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 you are you you're very lit, almost literally looping through that list of instructions until you get to the end and their tail recursion is the natural natural way of doing things um I mean, I guess you know there are there are situations where a tail recursion is more efficient. So, I mean, the, the classic example of reversing a list, um, where it's you know, re reversing a list by doing a performing a tail recursion, is more is more efficient than the structural definition, um, which effectively is is quadratic, whereas the um, the tail recursion is is linear. Because lists are constrained. Do you? I mean, I'm making sense. I mean, the the functions would be if I just add them in here. The simple reverse is is like this. Oh, I'm not sharing. Sorry, let me share yes. my screen. Yeah, yeah. Don't get. I don't get anywhere without sharing. Um, window. Okay. You know, the empty list. The reverse of the empty list is the empty list. Reverse of um, x x is is um, right is f of x is plus plus. And the, the the problem with this is that every time you um, save that. Uh, Uh, oh, I need to generate a large list. Oh, let's do it with a. Okay, well that's fairly quick. Um, but it is going to be quadratic. Now let's uh, let's let's just find a function make. Um, sorry, take. Sorry, do you mind me doing this? I shouldn't take too long. Is is this is going to be n stuck on the front of? I'm going to make a long list. So what this does is it defines the list of numbers um, uh, from um, Yeah, no, let's say greater than. Um, and then, uh, anything else is um, the empty list. Okay. Let's 
expectations. Can extra make 10? Okay. And then what we could do is, what should we do? Let's do extra add. Head off it. So let's define head of um, extra reverse of extra take take of ten pounds. Okay, let's try ten thousand, hundred thousand. Oh, yeah, that's oh, is my computer going to go bang? I mean, it's that's you can see that's now that's gone off into um, because in order to do this, I've got to make this list of a hundred thousand elements and reverse it and then take the head. And the answer should be zero, but it's it's just taking forever to make the to make the list. Okay, oh, there we are. But that took that took a long time. So let's go back into here and um, uh, do Trev. Tail recursive um, reverse Trev of X um, and X cons X's I is what we do is we take X off the front. Of and take x's and x x on the front of y. Okay, and trev of the empty list of i is y. And then trev with a single argument is is um, two argument Trev of um, mm, 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 X's and the X's. What this does to do the, recur the, re the reverse is it takes um, it takes elements one at a time off X's and puts them on the front of the empty list. So it moves them. And now if we do, let's go down to here, let's compile extra. Okay, and now let's let's do the same thing with um, Trev. Oh, I didn't save it. Sorry, that was a disappointment. Let's compile it, and now let's do the same thing. You see, you get the answer immediately. And we could say make of again. Mm -hmm. We get the same answer. Oh, maybe ten million. Oh no. Okay. Yep, we get the we get the answer. So that's basically linear. Whereas the 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 natural this direct definition up here is 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 quadratic. So there's a I think that's the classic answer, if you like. Is that okay? And when you have this tail recursion and also when in your one of your functions you kind of carry this state with you right yeah so this is like again think of this as when i go from here to here you're i have two not, variables one can say if i align this it's just well, you're, you're not sharing your I'm screen i'm not sharing the screen sorry yeah you're quite right apologies uh, yeah. So if I align these two, I think the the what you can think of as happening here is that you have two variables, and repeatedly you take the first one, you take the x off the front one, and put it on the the front of the other, and you you loop round here until each of the elements has been taken off the front and put onto the rear until you hit the empty list and then the uh, this is where you fall out of the loop and the answer is why. Um, so, you know, this is, 
this is like Trev loops to this case. So you loop around that until you hit this the case where the thing at the in the first position is empty, and then you just return the second. So it is just like a an imperative loop. You know, the, your, your, um, except it's using a bit of pattern matching in there. But apart from that, um, that's what it's doing. Okay. Um, yes, I'm not sure there is any other question. I had a question about, oh, Luis August has a question. Hi. Okay. Hey, uh, is there any relation between functional languages and type systems? Because like, I'm, I'm starting to, to study functional languages now. And I see that languages like Haskell and OCaml, they have very very rich type systems, very mm -hmm. efficient type systems. And I have never seen anything like that in other imperative languages. So that's just coincidence or there is any relation between the paradigm and the type systems? Uh, okay, I mean, I guess, I mean, you, you have complicated, I, I suppose what you do in a functional language is that what's crucial is data. So you're, um, you have, the structure of your of a lot of your what you're modeling is in the structure of the data whereas perhaps in and that that is rather than in values contained in in a sort of record which is what you have in a in a um in something like a a, a java object so i think the if you like the structure is more manifest it's more concrete in the data and it's not concrete in it it, it it's not hidden in some way in the um, in the inheritance hierarchy of a, of a collection of classes. So that's one answer. The second answer of what, about what makes um, data more complicated is that behavior is part of data. So you've got functions are data themselves. And what a function really is, is a piece of behavior wrapped up as data. And so you can pass that as you would pass um, as you would pass a number or anything else so that's that's the second thing that makes things complicated um, I guess where the type systems themselves become complicated is in finding ways of getting generality so um, there are patterns of behavior which you can represent directly like mapping which where you apply a function to every element of a list now that you don't want to write a different function for every different type of input list for example the behavior is exactly the same irrespective of what sort of things are in the in the list the function gets applied to them so somehow you then have to put on top of these type systems these notions of generality which allow you to use the same code in different situations and that you get this what, what's called parametric polymorphism where the same code is used on all sorts of different types and then you get ad hoc polymorphism where which is a bit like overloading where you get different code used but in the same way like you would i mean if you have something that um that wants you want to remove all the duplicate elements in a list that it doesn't that does the same thing over every type but it uses a different equality function over every type, but it uses that equality function in the same way. So somehow packaging that up in the time system becomes complicated. So I think the type systems become complicated when you try and combine generality with those, those extra aspects of type of, of um. so you want the type system to allow you to do as many possible things without repeating code, but to prevent you from doing the things you don't want to do. And so that's why they get complicated. Sorry, that, that's, that wasn't a terribly concrete answer, but um, if you think, look at the type in something like Haskell of, um, you know, look at the type of map and filter, look at the type of, um, of fold, you know, those all, you see how parametric poly polymorphism works and then look at types of things like you know, removing uh, a function like nub which takes yeah. removes all the duplicates from a list of things 
and you begin to see how those elements fit together. Adolfo, I'm, I realize I need to go, I'm afraid. Is that? Yes, it, it's perfect. Thank you very much. Just two questions. First yeah. one is, is it okay if I put your code in a GIST on GitHub to share? Yeah, perfect. Yes. Yeah, to share with yeah. the people that are watching here, and yeah. for people that that are watching and are not aware of the the Elixir and Erlang community, you and I, you, you are a part. We are a part of the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation. So I, yes. I, I everyone I, I meet in the, the community, please join the the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation. It's free. And there has been also I, I would direct people to go to the to the Elixir forum because people right now they are there discussing a case with a company called Brex, which left Elixir because Elixir is not uh, statically typed. So there is a, a long discussion okay. there. Okay, yeah. that, that that is interesting. And and that's it. Thank you very much, Simon. Pleasure. See, well, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. And thanks very much for the questions. That was really nice to hear those. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Many thanks.